to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Guess what? Happy New Year. Going to be a little special we're going to do here on this last day of the year. We're going to talk a little bit about current events, but we're going to talk basically what does our Father's Word have to say about the message, one of the most prominent messages that were give, was given for the end times. As we look about the world, I understand as we came to this live telecast that Korea thinks we have worked out an agreement with them concerning their nuclear facility, so we see peace there. And Saddam Hussein, it would seem that in Iraq, where not a great deal of talking is done, whispers sometimes, and the people are beginning to wonder and think that maybe Saddam Hussein is supernatural because he's been had the ability to stay in power now for such a long period of time after his severe defeat in the Persian Gulf War. And you must remember that Bam it is in Iraq that the old city Babylon rests symbolically then a type of the king of Babylon. So we see then others saying, that the Americas no doubt have demonized Saddam, and it is for that reason that he is still in power. So it's a little play on words, but we look around us, and when most of the world looks for peace, and it would seem that the peace talks in the Middle East between, between um, the Israelis and the uh, Palestinians at this time, they've kind of got off center, and they're beginning to move forward with a little bit of progress, but listen to me. They will cry peace, 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 but there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace, that is to say Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, returns to this earth and instills it. There will be that lull when the false Messiah walks this earth, when Michael casts him from the heavens, but you're prepared for that. Today, I want to take you to that time in Acts chapter 2, however, we're going to be reading from the book of Joel. The time is 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he tells his disciples on that 40th day, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive that that is promised, which was, of course, would appear on Pentecost, which in the Greek tongue means 50, on the 50th day. This cloven tongue came upon them, and they all began to speak with this tongue, certainly quite contrary to what many would think. It was clearly understood by every ear that heard it, regardless of what languages you might understand. Everyone, that's why it was called the cloven tongue in the Greek. It went out in every language of the world, clearly understood, no need of an interpreter. and. Many were shocked by this, which as in the sixth and the seventh verse of uh, Acts chapter two, they would say, they're speaking in the language, in the very dialect, in the hamlet in which I was born. And of course, every ear would hear it simultaneously. And they were accused of being crazy men or drunk. And Peter said, no, this, I repeat, now listen carefully, this is that. That's a figure of speech. This is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. So the big question is, what did they say? It would seem that people argue, well, it was an unknown tongue or it was a tongue. And let us first, coming out the gate, correct the fact that the word is not tongue, but language. It was a language that everyone understood. Get that said in your mind because that's scriptural. Acts chapter 2, verse 6, 7, 6 and 7. The big question is for the Christian then, if it was understood, what did they say? Peter told you, this is that well, that was spoken of by Joel. Well, what did Joel say? Hey, big surprise. That's what this lecture is all about for our new year, the year of our Lord, 1994 which in Sydney has already been brought in the new year. And as it moves this way around the world coming into the new year, this is the message for this year. Let's get into it. 
Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father as in the name of Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, and let's go to chapter 2, the great book of, of uh, Joel. And, um, and what does Joel mean in the Hebrew tongue? Yah is God, all right? There's no other, one only. Chapter 2 in that great book of Joel, this is what those tongues spake on Pentecost Day. Listen to the message. You might say, to be more accurately, this is the message of Pentecost Day. Got it? Don't ever let anyone deceive you. God's Word is complete within itself. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. In other words, these events that are described in this chapter would be the events that would happen just before that second tribulation. Got it? Verse 2, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. In other words, this will be the final episode of an army God will allow to be put together. It is described in chapter 1 as the locust army, simply that the method that it uses most resembles, in the natural sense, a field lush and green after, before a, a, a cloud of locusts move through it and that that is after, stripped, clean, bare, okay? But this is an army, though it is our enemy, it is still God that allows it and God controls or in the sense that he allows Satan to control this locust army, it is the self same army that you read of in Revelation chapter 9. Let there be no mistake. Verse 3, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them. It's lush. There's leaves everywhere. There's plenty of everything. But here come the locust before them, and behind them a desolate Wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them, not one twig. What are we talking about? We're talking about the deception of the end times as we move into a one world system. Controlled by who? By Kenites. Kenites that claim to be of our brother Judah in a one world system that will be arranged, do you see signs of it at this day? Certainly you do. What about NAFTA? We have one trade agreement in this hemisphere, north and south. What about Europe? European common market. And there is much progress there as far as a European currency, one and only. Will it come to pass? Ah, uh, not too many people can agree on all one thing, but it has been within days, two or three times, of coming into reality. One worldism, my friend, that is the deception, and not one blade shall escape it. Quite the contrary, as the fake ruler comes in peacefully, not with war, using this deception, gnawing on the very uh, nervous system and minds of those people that are anxious to be misled. Sound the alarm. Verse 7, 4 rather. <clears throat> the appearance of them, just what they look like, is as the resemblance of horses. So as we see here, they're certainly not locusts, but only the method that we, in which locusts strip something. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Horses in the sense that horse is always symbolic of power. In other words, they're going to have the power to accomplish this. Five, like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains 
shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Well, it's real sad. But one reason they will pass over is it will be the loudest cry ever of peace, 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 all for one and one for all, a one world system. That one world system naturally will receive a deadly wound and there is a people that will no doubt bring that to pass. Listen carefully. Six. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Now, occasionally there comes a word in the King James Version that I cannot allow to stand. So I'm going to ask, if I may, that the Hebrew word from which this word blackness is translated, is pulled up on the screen for you, and excuse me for looking away just a moment. That Strong's word happens to be paror, okay, paror. And it's from uh, 6286, properly used. It means illuminated, not blackness, illuminated, a glow. And as a noun, it is used to flush or a, a look of anxiety. So you would be better to translate it rather than blackness to say paleness. In other words, it's a, it is an awesome, anxious sight. And unfortunately, the one that illuminates, which is to say the serpent, uh, that is to say the false one, will illuminate their minds to believe that. That should not be, be believed certainly by the Christian. Sound the alarm. Wake up, my friend. The stages, the four stages of the locust army are already in process, in progress. Are you aware of it? Verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. Why? They are men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. That means in a very orderly, controlled set of ranks. And they shall not break their ranks, meaning, in other words, that it's very well organized. Worldwide, it is organized. Verse 8, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. In other words, nobody's going to stop them. Why? It's a war of peace, peace, peace. In other words, it is, has that power. And it is not, my friends, our army. It is the army of locusts described in Revelation chapter 9, coming against those that have not the seal of God. Do you have it? Okay, the seal of God, that is to simply say his truth in your forehead. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Now, how could that be? We know that in this nation, certainly we're not going to let a bunch of nuts jump on our house without blowing them off or break in a window without blowing them away, that's not going to happen in this nation. But what are we talking about then? How is deception carried? Many of you either have a little band of wire called a cable or you have a little antennae on your roof that has a little wire running from it and you let filth as well as good things such as your dear pastor come in via television and go on that stone that you call before you the image that brings forth whatever message that you might feel led to tune in. Right through your window, right through your door, invited right into your home, the very deception as well through the same wire, the truth. Sound the alarm. Wake up. We're in a time when many things have advanced. And yes, the enemy does come in your window. It does come in on the roof. It comes in via your television because deception is brought by words, uh, lies uh, from the enemy as well as 
the truth from God in his word, not man's word or the traditions of men. Sound the alarm, my friend. Many times things can slip up and others will be out still looking on their rooftops wondering, wonder when they'll get here. <laughs> my friend, they have arrived. Wake up. Verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. Uh, the sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. You know, of course, when this takes place, that the true Lord is about to return. Not that the sun itself disappears, but because his love and his the very shine of the Shekinah glory at his appearance is brighter in the heart and the mind of those that love him than the very sun itself, all right? Verse 11, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Yes, even this wicked army God allows. Why? People deserve it. The deception, the lies. Will they believe his letter of love that he has written to us many, many years ago? Or will they believe the lies that come in their window in this generation as well as many generations in the past? Hey, it's up to you, friend. How are you fixed for razor blades or what do you use for a brain? Can you think and observe and count the days? Can you observe the deception that is contrary to the word of God when God himself prophesied it will come to pass, it is written, and today it is coming to pass? Have you noticed? His army for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? You can. God is not angry at you when you are in his service with the gospel armor on and in place, being awake, having the seal of God in your mind, for you are told in Revelation chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, Satan is ordered. You cannot touch the mind of those that have the seal of God. Why? They know the truth. They're not going to bow to a, an idiot devil when they know who he is, pretending to be Christ. It, they find him rather than a temptation, an abomination. And they love the true Lord and will wait for that day. Don't fall for the army of God that comes first in the form of the locusts uh, in, a, in a spiritual sense. Verse 12, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn, this is your Lord talking to you, turn ye even to me with all your heart, meaning your mind, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And we should mourn when we see so many people deceived we see violence rampant around the world, and people don't know. Verse 13, and rend your heart, that's your mind, cleanse your mind. I mean, rend means, do you know, have you ever seen someone render uh, an animal down into the fat and so forth to make soap? Clean it out, and not your garments. In other words, don't worry about your garments being clean, get your mind clean and turn upon the Lord your God, unto rather, turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. In other words, what he's saying here, while all this is going on, all this deception, if you will turn your mind to the word of God that forewarns you, these events shall happen. Then know and understand that he's going to protect you. He repent and his loving kindness will protect you. And don't you ever, ever think that Christians cannot make a difference. I remember it was reported before the Berlin Wall came down that there were 10 Christians on the steps of a little old church in each Germany, and they began to pray. It took 10 years, but that crowd grew and grew and grew until the wall came 
down. Christians believing and knowing and God's kindness seeing it pushed it over with the fact that somebody cared. You make a difference when you're in his service. Verse 14, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? He will bless you. He'll prosper you. He'll prosper your ministry. Even a meat offering and a drink offering until the Lord your God. What are you to do? Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. I like to think that this big dish out in our yard called Big Mama, which is a satellite uplink that goes, covers this hemisphere, and even now as you listen around the world by short wave from that satellite, that we are in, in our own little way beginning to sound that trumpet. Wake up, my friend. Look around you smell the roses, you might receive a blessing. 816, gather the people, gather them, how? Into the truth. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. In other words, there is an emphasis here on the fact that we have groups of people here. They never leave the closet until the wedding. You never allow the suckling in the congregation, that, that is to say. But here he's saying, get them all in one house, that is to say, frame of mind. Bring everyone that you love in, into the truth, that is to say, into the sound of the trumpet the truth, the knowledge. 17, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? And as the 10 tribes of Israel would be taken captive out of, out of uh, Samaria, the mountain in the English tongue. And as they would go over the Caucasus mountain, settling Europe, those 10 tribes being the true house of Israel, I'm not talking about Judah here, the true house of Israel, many later gathering to this great United States of America, Canada, and around the world. They are God's people. And God looks down upon them. And we do have a God, and they're going to find out who our God is, Yahweh, the Father, the Creator of all things. 18. Then will the Lord be jealous uh, for his land and pity his people. I mean, love them, care for them. I cannot help when the word pity here is used in the English to remember in uh, that great book where God would say, name that child Lo Harama, which is to say, not pitied. And then he would later remove the Lo, which would make her pitied, the love of God returning. 19, yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you approach among the heathen. That day's coming, my friend. And what will he do with that locust army? Verse 20, and I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Yes, the locust army will be removed. You will read part of that northern army in the 38th and 39th chapter of Ezekiel describing this same C. 21, fear not. Don't be afraid. 
O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. The Lord will do much greater things than the deception of peace, 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 when there is no peace that you hear around this globe, even at this time as it takes its shape and formation into the peaceful one world system. Verse 22, be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. God's not going to let some atomic weapon destroy this earth. It is written, it shall never come to pass. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. There is an abundance of everything at his return, and the forgiveness, the reclamation. 23, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately. What is the former rain? It is though you plant a seed. The seed must have moisture to germinate and to push from the soil. So the former rain is that early rain that sprouts the embryo and that beautiful plant comes up from the earth. He has given you the truth that was necessary in its time. That's what he's saying. To sprout the seed of truth in your mind as you rend your mind and empty it of the false teachings and the traditions of men and get back to the word of God. For as it is written, so shall it come to pass. He has given you that former rain moderately and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now listen to me very carefully. The latter rain accomplishes this. When the plant is in its growth and the greenness is forth and it's ready to make fruit from into the seed, then it needs that latter rain to mature the head or the, the, the grain or it blasts in the field withers, falls away. God promises you that he will send, especially in the first month. What's he talking about? Well, how many months is this locust army going to be here? Five. May through September. At the first appearance of the false one, God will send you a truth and a rain of blessings that you'll have no problems for those that have the seal of God in their forehead. It is written, it is his promise, it shall be so, it is so. Absorb the moderate rain of that former rain as it falls even now. Sound the alarm, wake up, cleanse your mind of men's sayings and doctrines and absorb the truth of God's word and know it shall happen as it is rich in. Verse 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat. God's going to bless us. You can, don't, don't worry. And the vats that's, shall overflow with wine and oil, both the olive and the grape. 25. And I will restore, let's say, I will make good to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army, God letting you know here that that locust army is his army of correction for the end times. Do you have to be afraid of it when it is your father's army of correction? Of course not. Which I send among you, God even sends them. What do we have here, the palmer worm? It is the four stages of the locust from the very cocoon to the time it comes out and becomes the gnawah. That gnaws, um, it is the four stages as you look at the, the world conspiracy that is against Christ, that is to say Satan the controversy between he and God Almighty himself. Those four stages, are you familiar with them? They're well written in the Minor Prophets. Have you read? Then rend your mind and get back to the Father's word because governments act and react exactly as it's written. 
do you understand when you read this letter that your father has written to you? That is the question. He says, I'm going to control that army, and I'm going to, you don't have to worry about the ninth chapter of Revelation. God will handle it. How will he handle it? Well, let's find out. It's written. Verse 26, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed when you make a stand, when you let your voice be heard, when you stand for something rather than being a miserable, sickly wimp that is pushed around by every wind that blows in whatever direction. Stand up uh, and be a man, a woman, or a child of the living God. You will make a difference. 27, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, those tribes that went north settling Europe uh, and America and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. No, we shall not. Why? We have the victory. 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Now, my friend, you wake up for me. These are the exact words that Peter used on Pentecost Day concerning the tongue that was spoke, the message delivered. This is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. Wake up and hear it and receive it, for it will happen in this generation that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How is he going to pour his spirit out upon all flesh? Because he has a remnant that he's going to speak through, and all flesh shall hear it, as it is written in the 13th chapter of Mark. And your sons and your daughters, you preachers that claim women have no part, you better wake up. In this generation they do. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Why? As it is written in Mark 13, when the false Messiah, head of the one world system, takes his throne, those that fight against it or stand against it mentally, spiritually, and otherwise will be delivered up as converts to say, why would you love me? I brought peace to the world. Your family loves me? Please. And it is written that you are not to premeditate what you will say beforehand, but you will speak whatever is given to you at that moment, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. As the message truly goes forth to the world on all flesh, through both men, women, old men, and so forth. I, choose, I just choose to use the term old women because there are really not any old women. There are... Um, well-matured women. There are old men. All right, verse 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens. You got it? Handmaidens. Maids, rather. In those days will I pour out my spirit. The question is, my friend, are you one of his servants? Hmm? Or are you just floating around out here in the Thule's, don't know, come sick them, what time of the day it is, where you're going? Or anything at all about this letter that your father thought enough of you to write it to you? Have you read it? There are men and there are women and there are children that God is calling out at the sound of the trumpet, not just through this ministry, but the very voice and word of God that covers this earth in these end times to prepare them, sound the alarm, and warn them to rend their minds and be ready to understand the one world system as the son of perdition takes his throne. Verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. My friend, when did he say he would pour this out upon his sons and his daughters? The first month, not the fifth, 
not in the middle, in the first month when it is needed, when we need his superior help with the superior opposition, you will have it. He will use his sons, his daughters, his children. Question is, are you one with a seal in your forehead? That simply means, it's a figure of speech that means, do you know the truth? Do you know what's happening in this world? Otherwise, <laughs> he can't use you, friend. He use, uses people that have that seal, which means are informed about what he wishes them to do. Sorry, friend. Sorry, Charlie. Back in the water. If you don't know, if you don't care about this letter, hey, who cares? Can't use you, friend, for that spirit that will lead and guide. And as 10 people brought forth the destruction of the wall, I say to you that a handful, a remnant that started a long time ago in all parts of the world by the hand of God will cause the wall of the king of Babylon to fall also. And then will return the prince of peace, the true king of kings and lord of lords. But there is work to do first by the sons, the daughters, the handmaids. What happens after that? Next verse, please. Verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. In other words, at his appearance, his brightness is so bright and wonderful and loving that all other things are eclipsed. 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Have you called upon him lately, friend? Hmm? Where's your mind? You don't care? <laughs> Adios, amigo. See you around. Call on the Lord when you need him. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. As the Lord hath said, as it is written, the Lord hath said, and in the remnant, I repeat, remnant, whom the Lord shall call. One question. Is he calling you? I'm, this is not an altar call, my friend. Is he calling you into a deeper truth? Have you known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you'd ever heard? That it was sincere and in the simplicity in which Christ taught it, you knew you had a destiny and a purpose. He is calling out those handmaids, those men, those sons, those old men, those mature women, the children that hear his voice and his sheep know him. How about you? You ever thought about it? There are no accidents in this world, my friend, that just accidentally happen. It is written, and it shall come to pass exactly as it is written. The year of our Lord, 1994, is here. That is my message in the year 1900. In 94, do you want to take part in blowing the trumpet? <laughs> it's real easy to do. Keep it going. It's going well, and God is blessing it as we go around the world. Our Father's word, not the word of men. If he calls you, simply talk to him. Tell him you're available. Let him use you and then mature. Not some bottle sucking, baby bottle milk Christians. Not even diaper trained yet, but mature into the word of God and be a warrior spiritually for the living God. Do you have a destiny? 
Think about it, friend. Won't you do that? Think about it through the year 1994. We're getting close. All right, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed doing it. The voice that was spoken on Pentecost Day, what did it say? You heard it. It's not important whether it was unknown or known when the fact is it was known and the words you have heard from this platform today are the true words of Pentecost. For those are the words that were spoken that Pentecost day. Check it out, friend. Document it. Peter stated, Acts chapter 2. This is that that was spoken by Joel the prophet, that the sons and the daughters shall begin to speak when the Spirit comes upon them. Are you available? Hmm? Are you available for a good cause? Well, if God calls you, and you see, it is not a matter of volunteering necessarily. I repeat again, in the word of the wise is sufficient. If he calls you, come. All right, bless your hearts. We're going to stop there. Listen a moment.